I would never choose a favorite interview on Build Series because that's like picking your favorite child. But today was particularly fun because I spoke to a girl who is incredibly talented and also has a big heart. Her name is Azinma. You might know her as that viral violinist, the one that mixes classical music with contemporary hip hop. We talked to her about that. We talked to her about the leap into making music instead of becoming a doctor. And of course, we had to talk to her about playing violin with Beyonce. She's got a big, big heart and she has a lot of great chat. This is Build Series Sydney with Azinma. Joining me today on Build Series Sydney is a boss, a weapon, a master of the strings, a genre bending hero. She's hailing all the way from Brooklyn in New York. I am of course talking about Azinma. How are you doing Azinma? Hello, Danny. I'm so, so, so glad to be here. Thank you so much. So are you coming in from your apartment in, in New York? Uh, tell us, where are you broadcasting from? I am broadcasting from Brooklyn, New York in my apartment. It is, you know, obviously nighttime here, but thank goodness for selfie lights. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I don't mean to use you as our reporter on the ground, but what is it like over there at the moment? Are you in the thick of it? What's the tone on the street at the moment? Well, I mean, COVID-wise, uh, COVID things are really good in New York. Honestly, New York is one of the better places in the U.S. right now, but it's starting to pick up a bit. And um, <laughs> yeah, that's always a little bit discouraging, but as a musician, I'm just like, okay, more time to practice. Like. Mm on the bright side of things. But then in terms of other things, you know, we're super excited. We have an election coming up for presidency here and it's a really November 3rd. If there are any Americans watching, please, please, please vote. It really matters. Whoever you vote for, just vote. Um, and that's super exciting and we can feel that energy here in New York. So, you know, it's 2020 has been a crazy year, I think, as it comes to an end. We're hoping for something better. So, yeah. Mm. <laughs> Definitely. Um, now, I guess something that my friends in New York um, uh, have been really looking for is escapism, something to kind of take away uh, all the worries of the world and just to go somewhere peaceful for a little moment. And this brings me to your Beethoven, uh, absolutely incredible working. Um, I must talk about Beethoven pleads the fifth. Uh, and most importantly, that music clip, oh my God, it's like it was a Monet painting. You look like you're in like a fragrance commercial. Um, uh, tell me about this music clip. Is this something that you had in mind uh, when it came to fruition? Beethoven, the latest fragrance. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> Smell like an old dead white guy. <laughs> um, so, you know, the... You know, the inspiration for this song, it's interesting that you say Monet painting because there are no lyrics or anything. So visually, when I write, there's just so much. I mean, I love art. I love color. And, and in the music, I actually can see the color. That was kind of my inspiration in writing it. When it came to the visuals, we wanted there to be that same level of art and um, nuance in the visual aspect to just be so rich that that was really important in both of those of those components. So and maybe it looks like a fragrance ad, but I mean visually it's compelling. Hopefully it smells great too. Like <laughs> but yeah. I mean I did half expect you to start riding a horse across a desert for no yeah. reason. Um <laughs> But, you know, it would have gone very beautifully with the song. And I think that that's what makes um, your music so incredible is the sense that you are listening to this beautiful classical music. But, of course, you're dragging this into the, the modern world. And, and it makes me wonder what kind of classic music um, is your favourite kind of classic music to listen to? And then what is your favourite kind of modern music that you like listening to? Good question. So my favorite classic, like my favorite classical composers are Beethoven, um, Debussy, just Ravel, an expert at color and using instruments. Um, I also, right now I'm relearning Tchaikovsky violin concerto. I love Tchaikovsky, the way that he can use melody and, and um, just kind of repeat the same thing again and again and again, but in such different and nuanced ways. So it's hard for me to pin down my favorite, but I think I would have to say Beethoven and Bach, just because 
and Mozart operas, but it's just, there's so much there and there's so much you can study until you die, just in the, mm. that, that repertoire. Um, but when it comes to my favorite type of music from the classic side, it's actually more the modern classics, more the minimalist. So I love Philip Glass. I love Max Richter. I love Oliver Arnold's. Um, those are some of my favorite kind of more modern approaches to classical music and kind of reimagining it. And when it comes to the modern pieces that I love, um, I mean, this isn't so modern, but I love Stevie Wonder and Nina Simone and Pop Smoke. I love how he's kind of taken, you know, he recently died, but took the drill sound and mix it with US hip hop. And I'm just always looking at people who are mixing genres and kind of pushing the boundaries of what is this box and how can we make it bigger and fit more sounds and include more people. So. Mm. You mentioned like all of my favorite artists. I, it's some part of me, I feel like I'm going to be that dude that stands in front of the DJ and yells requests. That's kind of what I'd like to do with you, but I'm going to behave myself. Um, <laughs> and I really want to talk to you about your playing style because I think that that also makes you incredibly unique. And I hope you don't mind this analogy, but there is a lady called Esty Heim from a band called Heim. And she does yeah. this thing, which is referred to as the bass face. So when she plays, she go, it's quite a, a thing. But for you, you do the complete opposite. You do the, something I'd like to call the Zinma grace face, <laughs> where you still, you're so composed as you play. Is this something that takes effort to look so good while also playing? It's a, actually a very funny question um, because Yes. So back in my super classical days before I was ever video recorded, you know, I'd play the violin and I'd just be like, you know, and it's just, it's not a very attractive face. And I, the first time I saw myself video recorded, I was like, oh my God, like, this is how I look when I play the violin. And, you know, I, I think it's weird to be super smiley when you're playing the violin or to look false or whatever, but I was like, you know what, when it comes to my videos, let's not have such a stank face. Let's just a bit more refinement. But I will say it's impossible to not feel the music and for it not to show in your face. Like it's, I tried when I was younger, I was like, oh, I just don't want to make a face. But it's actually, I'm learning that is the expression. Like that is a part of the music and the way that makes me feel. And it just manifest itself in my eyebrows and in my eyes and the way that I'm playing. So yes, bass face is very real and violin face is very real. I think in the grand scheme of things, violin face is in general a bit more graceful than bass face, but <laughs> that's just the nature of the instruments. <laughs> mm. And I mean, that is something that I find very fascinating is that the violin as an instrument uh, so closely replicates uh, the vocal cords uh, of a singing voice Right. And it almost seems like you're singing with your face, even though the notes come out of the violin. That's um, amazing, yeah. Yeah, Definitely. and one of, yeah, one of the first things that I saw, and uh, of yours at least, was just incredible. I really wanted to talk to you about it. The Post Malone cover of Rockstar. Now, to paint a picture for people who haven't seen this video, you're on an, a New York subway train and you're playing Rockstar, but, why is the train empty and how do you keep your balance on a moving train while playing and also keeping the grace face of the violinist? Oh my God, this grace face thing is funny because it's like, I, I feel like it's not very graceful, but thank you, Danny. Um, so yeah, first of all, the video is pre-COVID. So it was empty, not because of COVID, it was just empty because for some reason we found a New York F train that had nobody in it. And in New York, when you see an empty train, you're scared. You're like, either somebody like use it as a toilet or there is some other nasty thing that you just don't want to see. So usually New Yorkers are terrified or maybe it's like at the summer and there's no air conditioning in the car. So I, we took a risk and we went in the car and it ended up being the place for a viral video. And um, I was wearing these like chunky Doc Martin boots and the train, it goes really fast. I think it was like between like J Street, when it goes under the bridge, it just goes mad fast. And I almost fell and it was crazy, but we got it and in one take and boom, it went, it, it just did so well that video. People were like, this is crazy. 
And actually that's the video that led me to sign with Universal and a at the time he found that video and was like, I saw this and I was like, who is this girl? We got to sign her. And like, it's crazy. Like, I guess the moral of the story is don't be afraid of empty New York subway cars. <laughs> things but, can happen. <laughs> yeah. But, but on the way out, you did step in a dog turd or, or something. Right. Was, yeah. Um, I mean, this is really interesting because like that was, I guess, a, a video which did find virality. And yeah. if we're allowed to talk about virality for a moment, here's my segue. You were studying biochemistry. I mean, you were, a, you are a smarty pants. Uh, and there has to have been that fork in the road moment when you had to decide, am I gonna be a doctor or am I gonna take a gamble at being a professional sound maker? Can you tell me when that moment was for you? Yeah, so I was in college. I was at the University of Nebraska because I'm from Nebraska. And my dad was like, no, 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 no. You're going to, you're going to study medicine. You're going to be a bio. Like I, and the thing is, at the time, I just didn't even think it was possible to be a musician. So that is a, a, an important part of the story because where I'm from in Nebraska, there aren't many creative people. It's just not an industry where Maybe you're in a wedding band, or but you don't really get to see successful artists like you do in a place like New York, or I would imagine Sydney. And so um, I went to school and did biochemistry and mathematics, and I did violin on the side. And when I was 19, I went to college when I was 17, I just turned 17. And when I, when I was 19, I was halfway through my program and I just realized that I was doing a disservice to who I am. I wasn't following my purpose and my reason for existing, which is to be a sound maker. And of course I could have had a more successful career maybe, or I could have made more money or whatever types of, there would have been more security. You know, I don't, I don't even think it's about making more money. It's just, there would have been more of a security in it. But to anybody who's watching or listening to this right now, and you're on the fence about what to do in your life, you're at a crossroads, my answer and my guidance to you is just follow your heart because when you're aligned with your purpose and it's all like in sync, everything comes, the connections come, the, the success comes, the, the finances come, security will come. It just takes that initial risk and investment in yourself. And then I really believe you will be rewarded. So that's what happened. You know, it was scary. And there were like so many years in New York, I was super broke and like, why am I doing this? But I was just so in love with the music that I, I knew it was right somehow. So. Yeah. And I feel like that there would have been uh, one specific moment when you realized that that was the right decision. And if you allow me to get a little bit profound, um, there is a line that Jay-Z happens to sing in a, the introduction of a song called Crazy in Love, uh, mm -hmm. where he proclaims history in the making. And never has that been more true than in 2018 at Coachella, where the first African-American woman to headline Coachella performed, and then Coachella got renamed Bay Cella. And you were on stage performing with Beyonce. Uh, looking back, uh, was that a real like moment where you were like, yep, correct decision? <laughs> yeah, definitely. And you know, if that, that performance, we started working on that in November of the previous year. And like, there were parts where I was like, oh my God, I wrote this part and that's me being recorded. And that's, you know, it was just mind blowing to be a part of something that impacted culture so much. You know, it, you know, I don't think of myself as having that type of effect ever, but Beychella was that. That was a very clear message from her that this is American Black culture. This is who we are, and this is beautiful. And she had all these amazing artists on stage from all walks of life, you know, dancers, baton twirlers, violinists, like everything. And, and we, were, we all came together and created the show for her and for us. And that was a moment where I was like, oh my God, I, I can't believe this is what I'm doing. And interestingly, after that, they had asked me to go on tour and that was another bit of a fork in the road. And I, I was like, you know what, Beyonce? I am not going to go on tour. I'm going to choose. Oh, no! 
<laughs> Danny, sit down. What do you sit mean? <laughs> don't, you don't say no. Oh, God. Oh, you don't say no to Beyonce. You don't have to react like that. You would be like the world's worst therapist with that. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, sorry, let's I, back, back and track. I know it's crazy. I just, it was such a hard decision. And then I, I you know, worked with them for three years. And, it, and again, it, the door is still open. You know, if they ever, ever, ever need me again for anything. But... I just really want, I felt so inspired and my cup felt so full that I was ready to write my own music for the first time and mm. to not do covers, not do someone else's music, not do Stevie Wonder, not do Mac Miller, not do any of these people, like just do my own thing. And that's mm. what I did. I moved, I, you know, I said no to like, again, security and, and I, went to Brooklyn and I rented a really small apartment for a few months and I just worked. And then a few months later, that's when actually Universal reached out. And it was crazy just because I never in my life imagined signing with one of the biggest classical labels ever. But I, I don't think that opportunity would have presented itself had I not made that decision. Yeah, and listening to your heart the first time around obviously bore such great fruit. So quite frankly, I, I trust uh, your gut more than I would ever trust mine. Um, so, uh, and one thing that I would say, particularly from looking at that performance uh, at Coachella and then um, the effect it might have had uh, for the world in general is that there was a video that you posted on your Instagram and it nearly made me cry. I'm not gonna say it did because that'd be embarrassing, but it was a bunch of children and they were all playing on little cardboard uh, pretend violins. And it got me in the fields. Um, and on that note, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your advoc advocacy for music education. Um, I really wanna know about Heartstring, um, your, your nonprofit foundation, because I think that that is really, really beautiful. Yeah, well, you know, Danny, those video, that video made me cry too. I, my passion is music, but my purpose is really education. And growing up in Lincoln, Nebraska, I, you know, I didn't see my another person of color playing the violin until I was 15. And that's also like very extreme, or maybe I was 14, but I, was, I had gone away to a music festival to, to learn and to study. And I was like, oh my gosh, there are other people who look like me and play the violin. And that had just never been a part of my experience. You know, YouTube wasn't really a thing then. It was just, you know, it was really, it felt very lonely. And my mission with my educational program is to give all kids access to quality instruction, to instruments, to concerts, to, you know, to workshops with great artists. And that's what the, the vision and the purpose of Heartstrings is. And, you know, because of COVID and everything, it's just been a bit, everything has been kind of paused, but, you know, we're always looking for people to support and to help out. And, you know, you can go to my website and check that out. But you know, in quarantine, I started a project where we were making violins at home from a macaroni and cheese box and a ruler and the kids who were sending videos of them playing. It was just so sweet and, and amazing. It led me to partner with Wide Open Schools and I'm doing another project um, at the end of October. I am an Accenture sponsor and I'm doing an outreach with some kids who are more high at risk and again, talking about music. And that's just my passion and love and it's just to use music to guide kids and show them that anything is possible that you can do it don't let society tell you what you can and cannot do just be disciplined be focused and anything is possible so that's kind of my a bit of my my heartstrings it's just music education okay um look clearly you have a big big heart and it's in your nature to give so my final question is what will you be giving the world next? Where can we see as in my, uh, when could we, uh, what, what, what can we expect around the corner from, from Ezzy musically? 
So on Friday, great question. On Friday, I'm dropping a new single called The Valdi Springs Fourth. It's very similar to actually my violence right here. It opens with um, the very iconic Four Seasons. Um, that thing, right? So it opens with that and it's again like a very, very cool fusion of hip hop and Vivaldi and then it goes into some Bach and like, so that's really, really exciting. After that we have an amazing Christmas track called Drummer Bay. It's a play on Drummer Boy and then I'll be dropping my full EP at the top of February. So we have a lot of music coming out. Um, so definitely stay tuned for that. Uh, that is incredible. Uh, well, may I say, uh, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on Build Series, Sydney. <laughs> and I'd like to ask you to do one thing I would never ask any other guest. And that is, as we uh, wave goodbye to you, can you play us a 15 second uh, playoff melody uh, for us? Sure. <laughs> Let's see. I'll just play the melody. <laughs> version <laughs> the best closer to an interview ever um thank you so much Ezzy, and uh, all the best take care bye